realize it. And so we'll take a look at this representation. So that's Kelly. She, her hair is on fire. Well, fire, you know, that's, that's a numinous phenomena, dangerous but transformative. She's wearing a headdress of skulls. Um, she has a weapon in this hand and, and uh, she has a tiger's tongue. She often has a snake around her waist. Um, need, none of these do, but she often does. But in this case, the then that's because, you know, it's a snake. We, we've already covered that. Well, these things that look like snakes here aren't. You notice how her belly is concave? Well, it's because she's just given birth to this unfortunate person that she happens to be standing on and she's eating him intestines first. And that's a fire ring which she is in and then it's got skulls on the inside of it. It's like, what's that supposed to do? Well, partly it's supposed to represent that which terrifies you. It's like, yeah, fair enough, man. Because I don't imagine you saw all those things in there before I explained them, but someone who was familiar with that image would know what it meant. It's like some poor artist was sitting there thinking, well, how do I represent destruction? And it's like, bang, whoa, okay, we'll put that down and then we won't look at it again. So, and then what do you do with this? You make sacrifices to it. And you think, well, that's kind of primitive. You know, first of all, well, that doesn't really exist. Well, it does if it's an amalgam of threat symbols, I can tell you that, it exists, that's for sure. So it exists as an abstraction, if nothing else. Do you offer it sacrifices? Well, what the hell do you think you do? What are you doing in class? Why aren't you like drinking vodka and snorting cocaine? You know, because you could be doing that. Instead, here you are listening to me, you know, slaving away in university, you're young, it's like, really? You've got nothing better to do than sit there? You know, well, what you're willing to forego today's pleasure for tomorrow's advantage. And that's what sacrifice is. And human beings discovered that dramatically first, you know, like we were, we were apes for God's sake. We didn't just leap up and think, oh, we better save for tomorrow. You know, we, it took thousands of years for that idea to emerge. And it emerged in dramatic form. And it was sort of like, well, Society is sort of like a god. No, they weren't thinking this through. It's like if you're going to represent society, well, it's like this masculine god that's always judging the hell out of you that's everywhere all at the same time. It's like, yeah, yeah, that's true, absolutely. And what do you have to do with it? Well, you have to give it what it wants. Why, why do you have to give it what it wants? Because it'll crush you if you don't. And that's exactly right. And if you're lucky and you give it the right sacrifice, then it'll smile on you and you get to have a good life. And that was like, that was the major discovery of mankind, man. That was a killer discovery. It was like the discovery of the future. You know, we discovered the future as a place. And it was a place that you could bargain with. You can bargain with the future. Wow, that's just, what an idea that is, you know, it's, it's so unlikely. Well, how do you bargain with the future? Well, you give it what it wants. And, you know, some of that's you maintain your social relationship and, you know, you make yourself useful to other people and you shape yourself so that you can cooperate with people and you, you don't act impulsively and maybe you squirrel something away for the next harvest, even if you're hungry and, you know, and then the future isn't hell and you make the proper sacrifices and so if you sacrifice to Kelly then she turns into her opposite and showers benevolence on you and that's mother nature right it's like look out for mother nature man you know two weeks out in the bush right now and you're dead and it's not pleasant and then if it's the spring you last longer <clears throat> but the bugs eat you and so that's not very fun either so nature, you know, it's bent on your destruction. But if you treat it properly and carefully and make the right sacrifices, then maybe one of her trees will offer you some fruit and that would be okay. And so believe me, lots of people died trying to figure that out. So here's another way of looking at it. So I said, you know, order and chaos, known, unknown, explored territory, unexplored territory. I love this. This is the Taoist symbol. It's a symbol of being. And being isn't reality as you would conceptualize it as a scientist. It's more like 
reality as it manifests itself to you as a living thing, which is completely different. You know, science extracts out all the subjectivity. All that is there is an array of objective facts of equivalent value. And that's part of its method, but that's not the world in which you live. The world in which you live is full of motivation and emotion. It's full of terror and pain and joy and frustration and, and other people, that's for sure. And so that's the real world. And so, well, that's what this is. It's, it's the real world. And what is it made out of? Well, it's made out of all those things you know that can get out of hand, you know, because the explored territory and the known can get so damn tight that it's nothing but a tyrant and then it's all those things you don't know and that's pretty exciting because you know you want to go find out some things you don't know and that adds a lot of spice to life you want a little adventure you don't want to go out with someone who's so predictable that you know everything about them in a week you know unless you're hyper conservative you want to go out with someone who's got they're a little erratic like not too erratic let's say they're a little dangerous perhaps not too dangerous, but some of that at least, you want predictability with a bit of unpredictability in there. Well, and that's exactly what this means. It's like that's predictability with a little unpredictability in it. And what that also means is that what you know can be turned into what you don't know just like that. And that's going to happen to you lots of times in your life, man. When someone close to you dies suddenly, it's like poof! Order turns into chaos, and now you're in chaos, and what the hell are you going to do there? And that's a good question, because you need to know what to do there, because you're going to be there. And it happens to you when your dreams fall apart, you know, I mean, your dreams for your life, or, you know, when you discover something awful about yourself that you didn't know, or, you know, it flips on you all the time, and in small ways, sometimes, you know, you have a fight with a friend, or in big ways that, that wipe you out for... Well, indefinitely sometimes, because you can fall into chaos and never get out. You know, that's the people who are trapped in the belly of the beast. It isn't necessary that when you descend into chaos that you learn something and you get back out. You could just be stuck there, suffering, until you die. And that's, you know, I wouldn't recommend that, you know, it's something to avoid. But it, it happens to people all the time, all the time. You see them wandering around, you know, shattered on the streets of Toronto, you know? They're done. They're in chaos. And there's so much chaos around them that you won't even go near them. The chaos spreads like eight feet around them. And so when you see someone like that, you're like, well, first, we're not going to look too cl closely, and people like that often don't like you to look at them, because that also helps them remember where they are, and that's no pleasant thing. And you're going to just stay away from that. Maybe you'll cross the street. Maybe you'll keep your head down. Whatever, you're not going anywhere near that chaos, and no bloody wonder, you know. And, and you don't think about it much after you pass it, because it's a hell of a thing to think about, and what are you going to do about it anyway? So you don't know what to do about it. You might just make it worse. Well, so chaos, you know, that's the other half of life, and it can turn into order, sometimes better order. That's actually what you do when you explore, right? You explore, you find out something new, not too new, not too Pandora, boxy. You know, you, you bite off as much as you can chew, but no more. And so that rearranges the way you look at the world, but you're doing it voluntarily, so you can kind of tolerate the, the recalibration. And you strengthen the order, right? Because now you become more competent. And I would say that you're trying to live on the edge between order and chaos. And I, and I mean, that's a real place. That's an actual, it's a meta place. But it's more real than places. Because it's so old, it's such an old place. It really exists, and your nervous system knows that. It sees the world this way. In fact, the right hemisphere is roughly specialized for chaos, and the left hemisphere is roughly specialized for order. Which is why the left hemisphere tends to have the linguistic elements, and, and why people are right-handed. And the right hemisphere has a more diffuse structure. It's more associated with negative emotion and imagination, and the two communicate between each other through the corpus callosum, and the right hemisphere appears to update the left, left hemisphere kind of slowly, often in dreams. And so, if you are hurt, if your right hemisphere is hurt, for example, back here in the parietal lobe, then you lose the left part of your body 
you can't move it anymore, but you also lose the idea that you have a left part of your body. So it's like blindness, it's a blindness to the left. And so if someone comes along and says, you know, you're not moving your left arm, you're going to say, yeah, well, my arthritis is bothering me today. I haven't moved it for six months. It's, well, my arthritis is bothering today. Or, you know, you're not moving your left foot. It's like, well, you know, uh, I'm too tired. Well, what's happened is the left hemisphere has a representation of the body and it's not being updated because the part of the brain that would notice that the left is gone because of a stroke, it isn't there anymore. And so the left already has a model and it's not going to change, it just, it's hard to change your model of yourself, you know, have a tooth pulled. What happens? It's like your damn tongue is in that hole for the next six months, fiddling around constantly, and that's because you're rebuilding your neurological model of your body. It's like, try that with your whole left side and see how well you do. You know, so this guy named Ramachandran was experimenting with people like this. And one of the things he did was kind of, he was checking their balance and you can do that by irrigating the ear with cold water and that makes people go like this, makes their eyes move back and forth because it upsets the vestibular system. And what he found was that if he if he poured cold water in the left ear of someone with right parietal damage who had left neglect, that they'd all of a sudden sort of wake up. Catastrophically, they'd have a terrible reaction to the fact that they were paralyzed on the left, and they would know that it had happened and cry and, you know, emit all sorts of distress and no wonder. And then like 20 minutes later, they'd snap back into their damaged mode of being and they would not deny, because that isn't really what it is, is that they couldn't update the model. They just didn't have the neurology for it anymore, so they were back to not noticing that it was gone and coming up with stories about it. And so, well, so that's a good example of how the right and left hemispheres work together and how they're kind of mapped onto this, weirdly enough. So, you know, we're mapped, we're adapted to the meta-reality, and so what that would be is, we're adapted to that which remains constant across the longest spans of time. And that's not the same things that you see flitting around you day to day. Those are just, they just like clouds, they're just evaporating, you know. There's things underneath that that are more fundamental, that are more fundamental realities, like the dominance hierarchy, like the tribe, like the danger outside of society, like the threat that other people pose to you and that you pose to yourself. Those are eternal realities. And we're adapted to those. That's our world and that's why we express that in, in stories. And so then you might say, well, how do you adapt yourself to this world? And the answer to that is, and I believe this is a neurological answer, I believe this, that your brain can tell you when you're optimally situated between chaos and order. And the way it tells you that is by producing the sense of engagement and meaning. So let's say there's a place in the environment you should be. Okay, what should that place be? Well, you don't want to be terrified out of your skull, like what good is that? And, you know, you don't want to be so comfortable that you might as well sleep. You want to be somewhere where, you know, you're kind of on firm ground here, but over here, you're kind of testing out new territory. And some of you, who are exploratory and emotionally stable, you know, you're going to go pretty far out into the unexplored territory without destabilizing yourself, and other people are going to just put a toe in the chaos, and, you know, that's neuroticism, basically, that's the, the, your sensitivity to threat, that's calibrated differently in different people, and more, some people are more exploratory than others, that's kind of extroversion and openness working together, and, and intelligence, so some people are going to tolerate a larger admixture of chaos in their order. Those are liberals, by the way, and, and I mean that technically. Liberals are more interested in novel chaos and conservatives are more interested in the stabilization of the structures that already exist. And who's right? Well, it depends on the situation and that's why conservatives and liberals have to talk to each other because one of them isn't right and the other wrong sometimes the conservatives are right and sometimes the liberals are right because the environment's going like this, you can't predict the damn thing, so that's why you have to communicate and that's what a democracy does. It allows people of different temperamental types to communicate and to, 
to calibrate their damn societies. So anyways, so let's say you're optimally balanced between chaos and order. So what does that mean? Well, you're stable enough, but you're interested, right? Because a little novelty heightens your anxiety. That wakes you up a bit. That's the adventure part of it. But it also focuses the part of your brain that does exploratory activity. And that's actually associated with pleasure. That's the dopamine circuit. And so, if you're optimally balanced, and you know that you know you're there when you're listening to an interesting conversation or you're engaged in one. It's a real conversation. You know, you're saying some things you know and the other person is saying some things they know, but the, the, both of what you know is changing. It's like, wow, that's so interesting. You'll have a conversation like that forever. Or maybe you're reading a book like that. Or you're listening to a piece of music that models that. Because what music does is provide you with predictable forms, multi-level predictable forms, that transform just the right amount. And so music is a very representational art form. It says this is what the universe is like. You know, there's a dancing element to it, repetitive, and then cute little variations that sort of surprise and delight you. And, and you think, wow, that's so cool. And it doesn't matter how nihilistic you are, you know, music still ins infuses you with a sense of meaning. And that's because it models meaning. That's what it does. That's why we love it. And you know, you can dance to it, and that sort of symbolizes you putting yourself in harmony with these multiple layers of reality and positioning yourself properly. And you like that too, you know? You'll pay for it. Oh boy, I get to go dancing, you know? Oh boy, I get to listen to music. It's like, what the hell are you doing listening to music? What good is that? Well, you think, that's a stupid question. I don't care about your dopey criticism. I'm going to listen to some music, right? It, it, there's no rational... There's no rational argument against music. It's like, you just don't even think about it. You just walk away from someone who's stupid enough to ask that question. It's like, pff, some things are obvious. Well, why? Okay, so that's pretty fun. So, what mediates between these two domains? Well, that's what consciousness does, as far as I can tell. And that's sort of the individual, and that's the hero, that's another way of thinking about it. It's the logos, that's another way of thinking about it. It's the word that generates order out of chaos at the beginning of time. It's the consciousness that interacting with the matter of the world produces being. That's basically it, that's basically you, for all intents and purposes. Um, how do you do that? Well, the unconscious does it to some degree, you know, because it's with our fantasy that we first meet the unknown, right? Well, look, say you're going out with a new person. It's like, what do you do? You project a fantasy on them. And then you fall in love with the fantasy. And aren't you stupid? Because you're going to find out that the <laughs> match between your damn fantasy and the actual person is tenuous at best. And so Jung would call that a, a projection of either the anima or the animus. You know, the anima is what a man projects onto a woman he finds desirable. It's like, oh, she's the perfect woman. It's like, well, how do you know that? You've like seen her for four seconds, you know, but it grips you. And the same thing happens in the opposite direction. And it's an action of instinct, you know. It's like you fall in love with the image. And, but interestingly enough, what you do in a relationship that works is that you actually, I think that what you see a rough approximation when you project the ideal and fall in love with it you see what could be it could be that but it's going to take you a hell of a lot of work because like you got no shortage of flaws and the other person has no shortage of flaws and so you're bringing your flaws together and that's going to produce a lot of friction and you're going to have to engage in a lot of dialogue before you approach that level of perfection again but Maybe you can do it, and then you get to live happily ever after. Well, wouldn't that be nice? Well, so the unconscious meets the unknown, and it, it meets it with imagination and fantasy and dream and art. That's how you take... See, you don't just go from what you don't know to fully articulated knowledge in one bloody leap. You can't do that. You have to extend pseudopods of fantasy and imagination into the unknown. That's kind of what theorizing is like, right? Even scientifically, you know, you don't know something scientifically, you generate a theory. 
Well, it's an imaginative representation that your unconscious is helping you generate. And so you meet the unknown with fantasy. That's what the unconscious is for. From the psychoanalytic perspective, that's what dreams do. And you can see why you dream about the future. You know, it's like, well, what's the future going to be like? Well, you have a little imaginative story going on and it's like, you don't really create it. It's sort of, you watch it unfold. You know, maybe you can tweak it here and there, but it sort of comes to you from wherever the hell things like that come from. You know, the unconscious, that's the psychoanalytic answer. It's not really much of an answer because it's more like a representation of a, th of a place that we don't understand. But that's where creativity comes from. And I mean, some people are really creative right down to the bloody core. So in my clinical practice, I often see people who are high in openness because they're attracted to me because they watch my lectures. And you have to kind of be high in openness to like my lectures. So because, well, you do, because they go everywhere, you know, and, and they're not necessarily very orderly. So, um, so anyways, lots of my clients are really high in openness. And they're funny people often especially if they're smart, because sometimes they have the most nihilistic intelligence you can imagine. It's just self-critical and nihilistic and brutally, brutal, man, and smart. And so they just criticize themselves out of existence. And so often I have to just try to get them to quit listening to their chattering ra self-critical rationality and go out and create something, you know, with their massive creativity. And as long as they're doing that, they're engaged in the world and happy as hell, but as soon as that self-critical rationality comes in and shuts down the creativity, they're just, they're just like walking corpses, you know? And it's because if you're really open, like that's, you're a tree and it has some trunks and, you know, your, your most prominent trait is the most lively trunk. And if you're a creative person and you're not engaging in a creative enterprise, you're just, you're like a tree that, that, has, been, you're, that has had its vitality amputated. And so, this is not trivial, this stuff is, this is deeply, deeply, deeply rooted in your biology. And, and those are people often who have, like, dream lives you just can't believe. I have one client, he has like four spectacular dreams a week, and most of the time we just spend discussing them. I mean, God. He, and I had another client who could be lucid in her dreams, which is more common among women, she could ask the damn characters what they represented and they would tell her. It was like, <laughs> okay, that was pretty weird. And like a lot of the things they told her were really helpful and they were not things that she wanted to hear. She, she basically, one of them told her she, if she was gonna live, she'd have to go visit a slaughterhouse. And the reason for that was because she was raised as a little princess and protected from horrible mother nature until she hit puberty in which time she turned into an evil villain because that's how the family worked. Perfect child, evil teenager, overnight. And then, well that was hard on her and she wasn't prepared because she thought the world was princess world and you know, she couldn't go through a butcher store without having a fit. And no wonder, you know, like really, Jesus, you know, it's, it's no wonder, but you do it. But she couldn't, so we used to go to butcher stores and that would make her cry and, and um, that she was a vegetarian, that would make her cry and, you know, bemoan the cruelty of the world. And it's like, yeah, fair enough, man. Those are bloody slabs of meat. It's like, I don't know why everyone isn't screaming when they walk through the butcher store, but, but you got to get used to it, man, because you can't live in the world otherwise. And so the dream character who was a gypsy told her that she had to go visit a slaughterhouse, which seemed rather impractical. And so I asked her if she could think of anything else to do. And she thought, well, why don't we go visit a funeral home and, and watch an embalming? And I thought, oh, good. That sounds, <laughs> that sounds like a fun way to spend a day. And so I phoned up a funeral parlor. And I said I had a client who was terrified of death. Yeah, <laughs> And I was a therapist who was also a little shaky on the concept myself. <laughs> And so they, they had no problem with that. And they deal with death all the time, which is really something to think about, right? A human being can actually have an occupation where they do nothing but deal with death and they don't go stark raving mad. It's like, what the hell's up with that? It's like working in a palliative care ward where your, your clients that you, you know, have a relationship, all they're going to do is die this week, next week, the week after. People do that. It's like, those people are tough, man. They're tough. So anyways, we went and watched this embalming, which was, I have a rather 
high level of disgust sensitivity, so it, it was a little on the rough side for me. But she sat there, and first, well, she was not, we were outside this little room, she was not looking at that man, no way. And she'd kind of go like this, and, you know, that was pretty good, and then she'd go like this, and then she'd go like this, and then, then she watched it. And then she asked if she could go in, and she put on a glove, and she touched the body, and she didn't have a fit, she didn't have a panic attack, and so she walked away from there, learning that there was a hell of a lot more to her than she thought there was, and that she could see things that she didn't think she could see, and live. And after that, she sort of had a touchstone. It's like, well, I'm kind of afraid of this. Well, is it as bad as going to see the embalming? No, it's not that bad. Well, I guess I can do it. It's like an initiation, right? She had an initiation. And so did I, you know, and I learned a lot from doing that. I learned that one of the things you need to do if you're going to be a human being is to prepare yourself to be useful in the face of death. And so when you have a parent that dies, which, you know, shatters people's ideas often, they can't even think about it. If you can't even think about that, man, you've got some thinking to do. Because you need to be able to at least think about that, because otherwise you're just going to be a wasteland when it happens. And you never know, you could even have a higher ambition. Maybe you could even be useful when it happens, instead of being part of the heap of destroyed people who also have to be taken care of. You know, and that's brutal. You have to be brutal to be useful in the aftermath of your parents' death. You know, you don't get to crumble and fall apart. And no, you have every reason to. So you got to be kind of some tough monster to manage that. But do you want to be useful in the face of tragedy or do you want to be pathetic? Well, you make your choice. So out of the unconscious, you get ritual, you get dreams, you get drama, you get stories, you get art, you get music. And that sort of buffers us. We have our little domain of competence and we're buffered by the domain of fantasy and culture. And that's really what you learn about when you come to university, if you're lucky and, and the professors are smart enough to actually teach you something about culture instead of constantly telling you that it's completely reprehensible and should be destroyed. It's like, why you would prefer chaos to order is beyond me. And the only possible reason is that you haven't read enough history to understand exactly what chaos means. And believe me, if you understood what it means, you'd be pretty goddamn careful about tearing down the temple that you live in, unless you want to be a denizen of chaos. And some people do, you know, because that's when the impulses that you harbor can really come out and shine. And so a little gratitude is in order, and that makes you appreciative of the wise king while being smart enough to know that he's also an evil tyrant. It's like, that's, that's a total conception of the world. It's balanced. It's like, yeah, we should preserve nature, but good God, it is trying to kill us. And, you know, yes, our culture is tyrannical and oppresses people, but it is protecting us from dying. That's helpful. You know, and yes, we're reasonably good people, but like, don't take that theory too far until you've tested yourself. And, you know, that's wisdom, at least in part, and that's what these stories try to teach you. There's a nice mythological representation. I love this one. It's like the dome of the known and the, the seeker looking outside. You know, that's a, that's a metaphysical representation. You know, and it, that is the world as it looks to us, right? You go out in a field and it looks like there's a dome covering it. It's a circle, a big circle, with a dome over it. And, you know, what's outside the dome? Well, the unknown, right? That's where heaven is, theoretically. You know, it's a projection, obviously. Heaven is in the unknown. Well, it was localized in space. I suppose that's partly because when people looked up in the sky, they were overwhelmed with awe. So, it's a reasonable conclusion, you know. It, it's a projection of an unconscious presupposition. It's a projection of fantasy, you know. Heaven is a fantasy, and, and I'm not denigrating fantasy, by the way, and it's projected imaginatively onto the sky, and that's part of the way you discover what's in your fantasy. Well, this is us, man. We mediate between chaos and order, and, you know, those are the two archetypal representations, fundamentally, you know. Um, and I think they apply to both genders, you know, like women can act as the individual who holds the world on 
his or her shoulders and males, men can play a maternal role, you know. Me, fe, female human beings are quite masculine and male human beings are quite feminine and so, you know, maybe, maybe this archetype dominates among men and that archetype dominates among women, which I would say is that is the case, as far as I'm concerned, although there are individual conceptions. And of course, those two things have to work in conjunction, but that's you, the eternal mediator between chaos and order, which also has its enemy. So that's, that's Horus there, and that's Seth, who eventually turns into Satan uh, as, the, as the West progresses, so to speak, and that's represented there as well the temptations of, I would say, resentment and hatred, which everyone has to fight with all the time. So, we'll take a look at this representation. So, that's Kelly. She, her hair is on fire. Well, fire, you know, that's, that's a numinous phenomena. Dangerous, but transformative. She's wearing a headdress of skulls. Um, she has a weapon in this hand, and... and uh, she has a tiger's tongue. She often has a snake around her waist. Um, need, none of these do, but she often does. But in this case, the stem, that's because, you know, it's a snake. We, we've already covered that. Well, these things that look like snakes here aren't. You notice how her belly is concave? Well, it's because she's just given birth to this unfortunate person that she happens to be standing on, and she's eating him intestines first. And that's a fire ring which she is in, and then it's got skulls on the inside of it. It's like, what's that supposed to do? Well, partly it's supposed to represent that which terrifies you. It's like, yeah, fair enough, man. Because I don't imagine you saw all those things in there before I explained them, but someone who was familiar with that image would know what it meant. It's like some poor artist was sitting there thinking, well, how do I represent destruct? You maintain your social relationship, and you know, you make yourself useful to other people, and you shape yourself so that you can cooperate with people, and you, you don't act impulsively and maybe you squirrel something away for the next harvest even if you're hungry and you know and then the future isn't hell and you make the proper sacrifices and so if you sacrifice to Kelly then she turns into her opposite and showers benevolence on you and that's mother nature right it's like look out for mother nature man you know two weeks out in the bush right now and you're dead and it's not pleasant. And then if it's the spring, you last longer. <clears throat> but the bugs eat you. And so that's not very fun either. So nature, you know, it's bent on your destruction. But if you treat it properly and carefully and make the right sacrifices, then maybe one of her trees will offer you some fruit. And that would be okay. And so believe me, lots of people died trying to figure that out. So, here's another way of looking at it. So, I said thousands of years for that idea to emerge. And it emerged in dramatic form. And it was sort of like, well, society is sort of like a god. No, they weren't thinking this through. It was like, if you're going to represent society, well, it's like this masculine god that's always judging the hell out of you, that's everywhere, all at the same time. It's like, yeah, yeah, that's true, absolutely. And what do you have to do with it? Well, you have to give it what it wants. Why, why do you have to give it what it wants? Because it'll crush you if you don't. And that's exactly right. And if you're lucky and you give it the right sacrifice, then it'll smile on you and you get to have a good life. And that was like, that was the major discovery of mankind, man. That was a killer discovery. It was like the discovery of the future. You know, we discovered the future as a place. And it was a place that you could bargain with. You can bargain with the future. Wow, that's just, what an idea that is. You know, it's, it's so unlikely. Well, how do you bargain with the future? Well, you give it what it wants. And, you know, some of that, and it's like, bang, whoa, okay, we'll put that down and then we won't look at it again. So, and then what do you do with this? You make sacrifices to it. And you think, well, that's kind of primitive, you know, First of all, well, that doesn't really exist. Well, it does if it's an amalgam of threat symbols, I can tell you that. It exists, that's for sure. So it exists as an abstraction, if nothing else. Do you offer it sacrifices? Well, what the hell do you think you do? 
What are you doing in class? Why aren't you like drinking vodka and snorting cocaine? You know, because you could be doing that. Instead, here you are listening to me, you know, slaving away in university. You're young. It's like, really? You've got nothing better to do than sit there? You know, well, what you're willing to forego today's pleasure for tomorrow's advantage. And that's what sacrifice is. And human beings discovered that dramatically first, you know, like we were, we were apes for God's sake. We didn't just leap up and think, oh, we better save for tomorrow. You know, we, it took that, you know, order and chaos, known, unknown, explored territory, unexplored territory. I love this. This is the Taoist symbol. It's a symbol of being. And being isn't reality as you would conceptualize it as a scientist. It's more like reality as it manifests itself to you as a living thing, which is completely different. You know, science extracts out all the subjectivity. All that is there is an array of objective facts of equivalent value. And that's part of its method. But that's not the world in which you live. The world in which you live is full of motivation and emotion. It's full of terror and pain and joy and frustration and, and other people, that's for sure. And so that's the real world. And so, well, that's what this is. It's, it's the real world. And what is it made out of? Well, it's made out of all those things you know that can get out of hand, you know, because the explored territory and the known can get so damn tight that it's nothing but a tyrant. And then it's all those things you don't know, and that's pretty exciting because, you know, you want to go find out some things you don't know, and that adds a lot of spice 